My name is Leah Bolger, and I am so thrilled to have you all here for this conference. All power to the people. All power to the people. This must be more than just, and it is, more than a slogan. Our country and the world are in crisis. Fifty years ago, Dr. King said that there was something in the center of the American spirit, a malady, that was making the U.S. society a threat to the entire world. He also said 50 years ago that the U.S. was the greatest purveyor of violence on this planet. 50 years later, that still remains the reality. A few weeks ago, when four U.S. soldiers were killed in Nigeria, the New York Times printed an editorial and asked the question, what are we doing there? Billionaire President Truman, Trump also commented, what are we getting out of this? New York Times, President Trump, you know very well what we are getting out of this. Global domination. We have to tell people in this country that you can't pretend that you believe in the sanctity of life, that you believe in human rights, that you believe that all li that black lives matter, while at the same time you don't speak out when the lives of Palestinians are being threatened and taken. When you have, when you have a humanitarian disaster in Yemen, where this state engages in a veritable rampage across Western Asia, or what we call the Middle East, where ancient cities are destroyed, millions of people murdered, and millions of people displaced. All lives, in fact, do matter. Um, and I'm bringing messages of solidarity, support from the peace and the anti-war movement in Ireland. Um, so we, we, do, we do exist. Um, you know, we're, we're a small, supposedly neutral country. We're on the periphery of Europe. Um, I say supposedly because the Irish state that came into being about 100 years ago, um, it was staunchly independent, it was neutral, it was anti-imperialist, and that's been systematically eroded over the last few decades. Um, we've been sucked into the military-industrial complex. Um, we support US imperialism now, wholeheartedly, at least the elite of the country do. Um, the people don't. Um, our government claims now that we have a policy of military neutrality, which basically means nothing in international law, but um, there, there's no such thing as that. But even if there was, we're violating it. We're participating in, we're supporting military um, alliances. Um, on the European front, if, if I may use that phrase, um, we just signed up to a thing called PESCO, Permanent and Structured Cooperation. It integrates the armies of 25 of the 28 EU countries. Um, it's a significant step towards an EU army. Um, I'm not going to talk about that now, but what I am going to talk about is that there's another clear breach of Irish neutrality, which is the fact that almost 3 million US troops and their weapons have passed through one of our small civilian airports, Shannon Airport, since 2002. You can go to these places, you can help the citizen activists of these countries. In, in Jeju Island, South Korea, for 10 years they were challenging a naval base being built there. Uh, how many of you all have been to Jeju Island? I know there's been a lot because they're, stand up if you've been to Jeju Island and wave your hand. Yeah, so we've got five people, five, five or six people that have been to Jeju Island in solidarity with people that have been citizens that have been challenging the building of a naval base on a pristine area of, of uh, this island of peace. They have daily protests there that if you go in solidarity with them, you can do the, the one, 100 morning bows with them. You so with this new hope of achievement and this new knowledge, 
you got a big movement and you get people coming from all over Germany. And why are they coming? Is it because the noise, the environment, I'm hurt? The cost? No. It's the prospect of black and brown people being killed all over the world from German soil. And that is there, and with the complicity of the German government. That's what has created this big new base movement. Camp Humphreys, which now has been expanded, so it's, they say now it's the largest U.S. military base outside the United States. 3,500 acres it has, and will have up to 45,000 U.S. military their families, civilian contractors, and Korean nationals. It's the largest U.S. military's peacetime construction project in South Korea. And who's paying for it? Well, we're not paying nearly as much as the South Koreans, and that's what's making them mad. They are having to pay 93%. See, that's what the U.S. government does. The U.S. government says, you need us there to protect you, and you're going to pay for it. Now, that sounds, that sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? This sounds like Trump. Well, Trump's ideas were going on long before Trump uh, had any political ideas. And until uh, the, Obama, the later part of the Obama administration, these two organizations were able to bring people from North Korea to the United States to learn about agriculture. But now that's all been cut off. Um, let's see. Thank you so very much. It was wonderful. Uh, VFB members uh, visited to Okinawa last year. Uh, watching the uh, film made me cry. Yeah. Anyway, I live in, we live in uh, U.S. and um, we started Okinawa Peace Appeal on the Facebook page, Okinawa Peace Appeal in English page. And then this time we start uh, uh, Justice for Hiroji campaign. Yeah. He will be... Um, Verdict, it's going to be done March 14th. 14th. So um, we are sending, we created this postcard and um, send a card to judge, to pressure. All, all, all over the world is watching. I think we are in a moment where we have an unprecedented opportunity to close significant numbers of bases abroad. Now, specifically, I think to do that, we have to capitalize on a moment where we, I think, can build a far broader coalition of people who are concerned about this global network of bases, far broader than we see here today, although I think this is an amazing start. We have people, high-powered people, saying things like this. The money we spend abroad is protecting other places like we protect Saudi Arabia, we protect South Korea, we protect Germany, we protect so many other places. So I'm saying, what are we getting out of this? Which Al referenced last night, so I'm guessing a lot of people know who said this. Anyone know who said this? <laughs> now, of course, this was candidate Trump. In practice, as president, basically the status quo has been maintained and if anything, expanded slightly. Not dramatically, but the number of bases abroad has expanded slightly. Basically the same status quo with the wars, some escalation of the wars, and the number of bases in Iraq and Syria in particular. But Trump is a symbol and a sign of a growing number of people across the political spectrum who are concerned for a number of reasons about U.S. bases abroad. 
You know, all these people don't share the same concerns, but I think we have to capitalize on the concerns. This is a map of schools in Baltimore that were closed last week because they didn't have sufficient heat. This is what it looked like in school in Baltimore. Parents were raising money to buy space heaters and coats for students. I can pretty well assure you that at this, at this new base in Vicenza, Italy, they don't worry about heat. They have schools there, multiple. This is the New York City subway platform over last summer. Numerous derailments. This is the metro not far from here in Washington, D.C. that has literally killed people, numerous people, more than a dozen, I think, in the last five years or so. Recent Amtrak crash. It's in Australia. It's in Antigua, Bahrain, Guantanamo Bay, Belgium, Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, Djibouti, Greenland, Hungary, Iraq, Japan, elsewhere beyond Okinawa, the Marshall Islands, Pakistan, Qatar, Spain, UK, approximately 800 bases in 80 countries around the world. There is no definitive list of bases, but if you want a spreadsheet in which I have tried to keep track of them as best I can over the last decade or so, um, it's available on my website, basenation.us. You heard the numbers about 170, 172, 176. What's that about? That's the number of countries in the world in which the United States has some number of military personnel. But the majority of those countries have just a few Marines in the embassy. The vast majority of the bases in four countries. Germany, Italy, Japan, South Korea but large numbers again, especially in the Middle East. So, if they were, so this is a major question when it comes to strategy. Are we calling for the closure of bases and the elimination of the military, not literal elimination, but the elimination of the jobs attached to those bases? Are we calling for a dramatic reduction in the size of the US military when we close? So, so many people in the room said yes, that's great, that's great, but we should think about the consequences of that call. Are we going to piss off a hell of a lot of people in the U.S. military and people who might be related to them? So someone said, we need, we need economic conversion. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. But we need to think strategically about what our call is. I think perhaps in the short term, it might be more advantageous to call for the closure of bases abroad, large numbers of them, and bringing US troops home, but not kicking all those troops out of their jobs, at least not in the short term. There is an annual uh, global infrastructure report that comes out, and you, the US is at, almost at the bottom of that list. Certainly, with a drastic cut in the military budget that is almost near a trillion dollars, and it may be that and above because we don't know about the secret funding that goes on, we can create a program similar to the WPA under Roosevelt and have an infrastructure job creation that will deal specifically with the loss of those, quote, jobs from the military. Who has closed the most U.S. bases abroad since World War II? De Gaulle. Shows us that a country can kick out not just one base, as in Monta, but all the U.S. bases. It's actually far easier to close bases abroad politically and otherwise, than domestic bases, because Congress doesn't have to be involved at all. 
Um, we have historically had a series of base realignment and closure commissions. Um, they focus mostly on domestic bases, but they've also dealt with foreign ones. Is one of our calls for a new BRAC commission? A great question. I think it, there are advantages and disadvantages, and I think we should talk about whether that should be a central call. Should Congress be more involved? I'd just like to say I think it's so important that we're adding health here to a discussion of environment so that we can bring in the health professionals, the public health professionals, the medical doctors, and the scientists as part of expanding and diversifying uh, the peace movement so that we bring these people in to support us in building a wider network within the United States and elsewhere as we, tr as we try to uh, broaden and uh, build solidarity to close bases. The article briefly describes six deadly EPA Superfund sites on military bases near Washington. ProPublica developed the search tool for locating environmental contamination caused by the military. They took EPA data and made it user friendly. Just Google bombs in your backyard. It's worth it. Blow up the screen and identify the sites nearest you and find out about the contaminants in your environment. So, let's take a trip down the Potomac River from the Allegheny Ballistics Laboratory in Rocket Center, West Virginia, to the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren, Virginia. So I'm gonna be talking about Puerto Rico, archipelago that was invaded in 1898, and that three years later, the US Supreme Court deemed it, and I'm quoting, foreign in a domestic sense. In other words, a colony. But more specifically, I'm gonna be talking about Vieques, and this is an island. Here is a map. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Vieques. So this is an island with approximately 10,000 people who for over 60 years were forced to live wedged between an ammunition depot to the west and a live target range, live fire range to the east. So here is a map that you can see. With the onset of World War II, both the U.S. federal government and the Puerto Rican colonial state um, approved the expropriation of three-fourths of Vieques to make way for the U.S. Navy. So the local people were forcibly removed for, from their homes, encouraged to emigrate, to leave the island, and offered to be relocated within Navy-owned plots of land from which they could be expropriated at any given moment. And I have a map there in which you can see that the white part in the middle is the non-Navy-owned land of Vieques post-1940s, the end of the Cold War. And in the colonial Puerto Rican scenario, that meant that there was a kind of democratic opening for dissent to be voiced that could not be possible during the Cold War. The majority of Superfund sites in this country are military sites. And they are either explicit military bases or they are military contractors. And so it gives you a sense of both the extent and the toxicity of the hazardous materials that are, that are used by the military and in support of the military. Another thing, as an aside, the Department of Defense resisted being regulated by EPA for their hazardous waste on U.S. bases in the 1980s. The Superfund law was passed in 1980. And then again, post-11, Rumsfeld tried to get out from under the regulation of the EPA, but in both cases failed. Only countries, no, so given that, that we do regulate hazardous waste in this country, even if we do a shitty job of it, and even if we don't acknowledge that health effects caused by the waste on site are a result of those wastes, as you said about Vieques, it's, it's said everywhere. Um, that given, only countries considered peers, such as West Germany, have the clout to negotiate cleanup of U.S. bases and nearby contaminated environment by, by the U.S. and to litigate against civilian contractors. Those countries of primarily non-white peoples have little to none ability to negotiate cleanups in their countries, and that's my subject today. In 1964, there were barrels of U.S. military waste discarded on land next to where you see that school playground. The U.S. built the school in 1980s. Land next to the school where these had been dumped, these barrels, were given to the local government 
which then filled them in and built a soccer field. In 2013, renovations to the soccer field by the local government, in doing that, barrels were discovered, some having high levels of dioxin, herbicides, arsenic, and PCBs. As I said, it's a common profile across all bases. Yeah, yes. very quickly, I think it's probably not news to many of us that uh, a vice president's son and attorney general of Delaware was very likely killed by open burn pits. But it is, to my knowledge, it just got in the corporate media this week that Biden, the former vice president, acknowledged, it read Joseph Hickman's book and acknowledges the conclusions that his son was likely killed by open burn pits. So if everybody in this room would write a letter to the editor, call a show, get into the media, the fact that it's not just a famous individual, it's thousands of Americans and tens and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans killed by these things, and, and the cleanup needs to be done and done now by the United States, it might be a way into the, uh, the corporate monopolized uh, communication system we've got going. What a group called the Vietnam Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign that is a project of Veterans for Peace as well as Vietnam Veterans Against the War has been working on for many, many years. And a quick reminder to you, you all have heard about Agent Orange dioxin, right? We think this is something that happened many years ago. We just commemorated 55 years during the summer of the initial spraying of Agent Orange dioxin in Vietnam. It began in 1961. It continued until 1971. 28 American bases in South and Central Vietnam. So if you take a look at the impact on the land, also take a look at the guys that are using the spraying from the helicopters and from hoses. No protective clothing whatsoever because they were told it's not dangerous to your health. This is the impact and this is a lasting impact on the land and the people in Vietnam. Children who today, because they or their mothers come in contact with one of the remaining contaminated sites in Vietnam are born with severe birth defects. This continues today. We also know that there were about 3.4 million Vietnamese who were directly sprayed by the planes. I live almost next door to the former home of James Monroe, whose Monroe Doctrine has evolved and abused over the centuries ought to be buried. The U.S. policy of anti-democratically and often violently seeking to dominate the nations to itself in the name of preventing some other force from doing so has seen its shelf life expire. The communism excuse is gone. The terrorism and drugs excuses are weak and getting weaker. This modern imperialism is unique to the United States. It may be that communication and organizing is all we need to end it using existing popular sentiment. Maybe we can even close the bases because of the ingratitude of foreigners for our imagined generosity. But would such a victory lay the groundwork for good behavior? U.S. exceptionalism that justifies imperial bullying is a prominent sentiment we may have to cure. U.S. nationalism has a religious character. Its destructive mission is imagined as sacred. Fort McHenry, Baltimore is not a historic site. It is a national monument and historic shrine. We may have to learn to value other things, including the other 96% of humanity before the empire shuts down. If it wasn't for the blockade, the US economic, commercial, financial, and travel blockade that has been imposed on Cuba for you know, nearly 60 years now, the people representing Movpaz, who you heard a statement from last night, or the historians from Guantanamo province or Caimanera a town that's adjacent to the Guantanamo Naval Base, might have been able to come here and speak for themselves. We look forward to the day when we can have the Cubans who represent revolutionary Cuba come to the United States and we can hear from them directly. The so-called Spanish-American War was the way the United States took over not only uh, Cuba, but Puerto Rico, and also the Philippines. 
and we can see the results of that uh, imperialist action today. We know because we've heard from Okinawa, we heard from the speakers earlier today, what a U.S. military base means for the people who live around it. It wasn't any different for the people who lived near the Guantanamo Naval Base before the Cuban Revolution. What the Cuban Revolution has done is protect the people of Caimanera and the people adjacent to the base from the kind of exploitation and, uh, well, they can't protect them entirely from the pollution, but from so many of the negative uh, effects that U.S. militarism has. The United States appear to be destined by providence to plague America with misery in the name of liberty. Those words were written by Simon Bolivar 189 years ago. The great liberator understood that liberation and the U.S. concept of liberty are not the same. When imperialists talk about liberty, they mean free access to land, water, and other natural resources for, pri for private development and profit. Ana Esther Cesena, in a piece published by the Ecuadorian Ministry of Defense in 2013, describes the goals of the U.S. in Latin America and the world. She says that the U.S. has two general objectives to guarantee the maintenance of capitalism and within it the primacy of the United, of the United States and to guarantee the availability of all the riches of the world as a material base for the functioning of the system, assuming that its hierarchies and dynamics of, po of power are maintained. Following the coup in Honduras in 2009, the U.S. built the Pomerola facility on the Sotocano base. Since the coup, the population of that base has grown by 20 percent. With the removal of the governments of, Dilma, of the government of Dilma Rousseff in Brazil and the right-wing electoral victory in Argentina, both these countries are courting U.S. military bases. In Puerto Rico, it is talk, the time is talk about before or after Maria, and that's September 20th last year. So there was already an unpayable, illegitimate, public debt of 74 billion. This was the result of municipal bonds sold by the Puerto Rican government to finance government operation, not to develop the infrastructure, and then borrowing to pay the interest of these bonds. In, in 2016, under the Obama administration, the U.S. Congress passed the Puerto Rico Oversight, Management, and Economic Stability Act, called PROMESA, in Spanish is PROMESA. Uh, creating the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, better known as La Junta in Puerto Rico, or the Fiscal Control Board. And so we see today uh, this Asia-Pacific pivot, which we're going to be talking about here on this panel, essentially created by the Obama administration and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. This idea of moving a strong percentage of U.S. military operations into the Asia Pacific, which will necessitate more airfields for our war planes, more barracks for our troops, and more ports of call for our warships. And as a result of that, then we see an expansion and an encirclement, largely, of Russia and China in the region. All of this is really being done because the United States hears language coming out of Russia and China, talking about a multipolar world, a world where more than one country makes the decisions about what's going on. And the United States just can't handle that kind of a concept. Um, South Korea is the third largest uh, host of U.S. troops overseas. There are currently 23,000 U.S. troops stationed there. The narrative that we are all familiar with is that the U.S. made heroic sacrifices to save South Korea from communist aggression during the Korean War, that North Korea continues to be a maniacal threat, and that's why our troops are still there today. The U.S. ROK alliance is treated as something that is sacrosanct, and questioning it is considered treasonous. What we don't hear about is the long history of the South Korean people's fight against U.S. bases, 
the very offensive nature of the joint military exercises, and how the U.S.-ROK alliance undermines South Korea's sovereignty and actually stands in the way of peace and reunification in Korea. The United States set up a military government in the southern part of Korea, and Koreans south of the 38th parallel thought that the Americans were coming to liberate them from the Japanese. But the Americans reinstalled in government positions the very same Koreans who had collaborated with the Japanese. And then the United States and its puppet leader, Sung Man Ri, carried out a protracted and very systematic campaign of counter-revolutionary -revo violence to decimate so-called communist insurgents, most of whom were people who had fought for national independence under Japan's colonial rule. At least 100,000 people, probably a lot more, were killed in the late 1940s. This is before the Korean War even began. And then the U.S. ROK alliance came about through the Mutual Defense Treaty that was signed in 1953 after the Korean War. But this treaty was in violation of the armistice agreement that was signed just a few months before that, which stated that within three months of signing the armistice, a conference should be held to discuss the withdrawal of all foreign troops and a peaceful settlement of the conflict should be discussed. And then the movement successfully shut down the, the bombing range in 2004, but similar to Vieques, to this day the U.S. refuses to clean up the toxic contamination it left behind. While that fight was going on, two teenage girls were walking on a two-lane road near rice fields in Dongjuchan. On their way to a friend's birthday party, they were crushed to death by a U.S. armored vehicle of the 2nd Infantry Division. That was in 2002. Again, according to SOFA, the South Korean authorities had no jurisdiction to investigate the incident. Okinawa is so important right now, especially with this coalition against U.S. foreign military bases. Some of you may have heard me say last night that I really think that Okinawa is leading the movement against military bases around the world and have been. This is what I, this is the image I think of. How many of you know, how many of you do, you do you know that Okinawans are not Japanese? Okay, maybe half, a little bit, 60%. Um, yeah, they are the indigenous people of the Okinawa Island that was colonized by Japan. The U.S. military, not the government, the military took over Okinawa from World War II to 1972 and then returned it back to Japan. It's a tiny island, but it's got a million and a half people. It's got 54,000 U.S. troops, 42,000 dependents of those troops, 8,000 DOD civilians, 25,000 Japanese workers on the bases. Uh, so we just went to Camp Schwab a few weeks ago, and we stood in solidarity with the Okinawa people who love to sing and dance, and I think that's something we should all work on here in the U.S. Um, of course, we didn't stay there too long until the Japanese police took us away. By the way, these aren't Okinawan police. These are Japanese police that come from different prefectures around the country because the Okinawan people understand their neighbors and they don't want to arrest them. The U.S. established the, its Air Force Base at Clark in Angeles City, um, which shut down in 1991. Uh, in 1947, uh, the U.S. Uh, Republic of the Philippines military bases agreement was signed, uh, which established a 99-year lease. Um, uh, the U.S. government had over the Philippines rent-free. Uh, in 1946, the U.S. granted, in quotes, the Philippines independence. So um, we don't consider that genuine independence. Um, in 1951, uh, the U.S. and the Philippine government signed the Mutual Defense Treaty, or the MDT, which is a treaty. So it's essentially a framework, a framework agreement, no? which many other agreements refer to. Uh, and the MDT basically says that, um, that the U.S. and the Philippines are friends. And, um, uh, and if ever one of them is attacked by an external party, the, friend, the other friend comes and helps the other friend out. And um, so that's the framework agreement. In 1991, the Philippine Senate votes to reject the renewal of the basis agreement. So this is where we have the shutdown of Subic and Clark. And I want to correct the narrative earlier um, that it was Mount Pinatubo or the volcano or even the Senate that brought down those bases. It was the people's movement that brought down those bases. The ruses for war by John Quigley, 
uh, professor of law at Ohio State University, 2007. In 30 pages and 100 meticulous footnotes, he makes the very strong case that Sigmund Rhee in the South started the war. Not all bases are alike. Some are worse than others. And to make that distinction, I think we need to look to the people opposing bases in other countries. How many else, how many other people in this room know what happened in Korea in 1980? There was a terrible massacre in the city of Gwangju after a big uprising because of a coup, the killing of their leader and the installation of an even worse one, and tens of thousands of U.S. troops on the ground backing all that up. I was in a maintenance unit, and we got riot training and thought we were about to have to hit the streets. What the F was I doing there? That, in fact, this idea of these war games going on twice a year in South Korea, I'd like for you to speak to that, if you would, how dangerous that is to the stability of peace in Asia. Justice for Hiroji. There are actually many people in our, all over our country who agree with us beyond the peace movement. They just don't know it until we talk to them and connect the dots. Four of the ten biggest U.S. foreign military bases stand astride the Middle East under the aegis of the Pentagon Central Command, CENTCOM, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Iraq, and Bahrain. And in the case of Israel, the whole country is a base for U.S.-European infiltration and manipulation of the Middle East to assert control over that region. I think what we've seen throughout the time uh, of this wonderful conference it's that U.S. bases are part of a much larger U.S. empire, and a lot of this is designed to facilitate U.S. Uh, economic intervention by U.S. corporations, U.S. Uh, uh, interests in regions throughout the world. And you see that so starkly in the case of the Middle East, uh, because there is one resource that our economy absolutely depends on, and that is... And so because of this damn resource oil that's polluting the planet and destroying life on the planet, we have been intervening in the Middle East to shore up the most repressive of regimes. And uh, let's start out just by looking at Saudi Arabia, which after the founding of this repressive regime based on this perversion of Islam called Wahhabism, the discovery of oil in the 1930s made U.S. governments ever since then, whether they were Democrat or Republican, say, we want to protect that regime of the Saudi kingdom and make sure it is not overthrown by its own people or by anybody else from the outside. Go to Oman. You see Oman there? U.S. base in Oman. Go to the Emirates. U.S. base is there. Qatar, U.S. base there. Saudi Arabia, U.S. base there. Iraq, U.S. base there. Turkey, U.S. base is there. Uh, then go across Georgia. They're talking about putting a U.S. base in there. Um, skip, Abhijaiba, John. Go to Turkmenistan, U.S. base there. Even up in there, Kyrgyzstan, U.S. base there. Afghanistan, U.S. base. Pakistan, U.S. bases. What does that tell you? Iran is totally surrounded by U.S. bases. But let me start with talking about the largest U.S. base in the Middle East and the oldest, Israel. General Alexander Haig said, Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier in the world that cannot be sunk, does not carry even one American soldier, and is located in a critical region for American national security. And that's how the U.S. views Israel, largest recipient of U.S. funds. This year, the Israeli Prime Minister, Netanyahu, reminded us of that very thing once again. He said, we're here on a mighty aircraft carrier. He was standing on the deck of U.S. aircraft carrier. And a few miles from here, there's another mighty aircraft carrier. It's called the State of Israel. The enormous number of U.S. bases in the Middle East to Central Asia, Iraq to Afghanistan to the Persian Gulf, also, though, exposes in the starkest manner the limits of U.S. power and its failure, and yet its massive destructive capacity. There's, there's no area of the globe that's so riddled with U.S. military bases. 
Now, this conference raised 800 U.S. military bases in 80 countries today. At the height of the U.S. military presence in Iraq and Afghanistan, there were 2,000 bases in those two countries alone. It could not secure, even all those bases, U.S. power or dominance in the region. Yes, we're dealing with the military bases. But there is a fun more fundamental issue involved, and that is the issue of the global strategy, imperialistic strategy of international capital. We have to address that, because everything we have been dealing with correctly traces back to this core. We have fought for the environment. We have fought against repression, racist, nationalist, ethnic. We have fought against dictators, right? All of them correctly, necessary. But if we do not go beyond that and see that the root cause of all of them goes back to this core element, we have not achieved a level that would guarantee us victory. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the project for the new American century. We cannot allow North Korea, Iran, Iraq, or similar states to undermine American leadership. This is the essence of global policy. Military bases are tools of the same policy. U.S. is not after oil in the Middle East, which is not main source for the United States for its own domestic consumption. The main concept of domination of the oil fields, control of the oil fields, is controlling the supply for rivals. Sarah Flounder said that she doesn't agree with David Vine's uh, idea about collaborating with the right wing. Um, I'm, I'm also not in favor of it. History has proven that it's, it doesn't work. When I look at the Movement for Black Lives platform and see in there they're calling Palestine a genocide and uh, also calling for uh, cutting the Pentagon budget in half, you say that is the total alliance and the kind of uh, platform that uh, brings in the issues that we've been talking about here. When you look at the Poor People's Campaign and you see not number 10 but number 2 is transformed from a peace economy to a war economy, uh, I mean, no, the other way around, sorry, 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 the war economy to the peace economy, that's very exciting, and that's a campaign that's going to launch on Mother's Day and is going to be, I think, something that's going to get a lot of people involved in a kind of transformative type campaign. So those are the alliances we really need um, to foster for the real changes we want to see. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, and uh, I got involved in the struggle against the NATO and the U.S. Uh, you know, um, military involvement around the world uh, when the conflict in Ukraine started. And uh, so it's a personal issue for me. Um, so Ukraine is just one of the recent uh, target uh, regions where U.S. and NATO uh, uh, continue to expand their influence uh, in what some people call uh, the new Cold War with Russia. And uh, in my case, in my country, uh, this expansion had disastrous effects uh, for the population of Ukraine, uh, including the civil war in the eastern part of the country, uh, right-wing uh, violence uh, and repression uh, by the state of uh, any kind of opposition. And more particularly, I've been involved with uh, activists on the ground in Odessa. Odessa, the city where in 2014, um, right-wingers uh, burned uh, alive or you know, uh, killed with other means uh, almost 50 people in the house of uh, trade unions, uh, people who were against the Maidan uh, revolution and the, you know, what they saw as uh, the coup d'etat by the United States uh, and its allies. Yeah, as, as the statement that Anya read said, there are more U.S. military bases in Europe now than in Cold War times. I mean, there, the U.S. Army is all over Europe. Germany, Italy, U.K. is where most of the bases are, but then Poland, Netherlands, Belgium, Greece, Portugal, um, Spain, I think there's about 3,000 um, troops stationed there. Um, 
Elsa spoke about Ramstein and Singanella in particular on, on Friday evening. Um, most of the, the material around the US's presence in Europe doesn't even mention Ireland or, or Shannon where t three million troops and their weapons have, have passed through over the last 16 years or, or thereabouts. There are actually only three countries in Europe that have opted out of PESCO. Denmark has always had a special opt-out clause from going, going back to Lisbon, um, to, even though they are a member of NATO. Um, um, the, um, the UK, of course, which is about to withdraw from the European Union, and Malta is the other one, which has neutrality officially enshrined in its constitution. US military aircraft being refueled at Shannon are, quote, unarmed, carrying no arms, ammunition or explosives, not engaged in intelligence gathering, and not part of any military operations or exercises. Just torture. <laughs> Just torture, perhaps, yeah, yeah. Today, Russia is faced with a massive military and political alliance that includes Estonia and Latvia, two of the five countries on, Western, on Russia's western and southern borders. Georgia, which borders Russia's southern flank, is not yet a NATO member, but has been accepted for membership pending meeting certain internal reform requirements privatization. Meanwhile, according to the NATO website, quote, Georgia has provided valued support for NATO-led operations in Kosovo and Afghanistan. Belarus and Russia remain allies, and in September 2016 carried out joint military exercises in Belarus well within the borders, well within its borders of, uh, with Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Ukraine. But this is how the exercise is reported by National Public Radio. In one of the biggest shows of military might since the end of the Cold War, Russia and Belarus are conducting joint maneuvers on NATO's doorstep. Much less well reported is the rapidly increasing military cooperation between the U.S. and Ukraine, including in the Black Sea, which borders both Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine is not yet a member of NATO or the European Union, but its Western-oriented president, who was installed in a bloody U.S.-backed coup in 2014, would like it to be, and has recently announced that a referendum on the question will be held soon. Meantime, the country, which shares a more than 12,000-mile land border with Russia, is acting as a NATO member in all but name. Дорогие друзья, для меня большая честь участвовать в вашем мероприятии. My dear friends, I'm very honored to participate at your uh, event. По одной простой причине, что это означает, что Америка это не только война и НАТО, но и мир. Because this means that the United States it's not only NATO and war, but it also means peace. We have no choice, just like the Tamimi family has no choice. I talked to the father and I said, you know, how do you let your children go out there? Your house is scheduled for demolition, and here they are protesting in front of the wall. Your son has been shot in the leg. Your brother-in-law has been killed with a shot from a sniper in his head. Why do you, aren't you, you know, why do you take these risks? And he said, we have no alternative. The alternative is to acquiesce. We will never acquiesce. And that's, that's up to us as well. We can't acquiesce. I'm going to start with a little uh, a poem from uh, Rudyard Kipling. And you'll see its significance, I hope, as I go on. It is not wise for the Christian white to hustle the Asian brown. For the Christian riles and the Asian smiles, and he weareth the Christian down. At the end of the fight is a tombstone white with the name of the late deceased and the epitaph drear, a fool lies here who, hide, who tried to hustle the East. That has to do with white supremacy, of which racism is a major, but not the only part. And I like to focus on that in my remarks here, since everything else about NATO has been so well covered. What's distinctive about NATO in this context? Anybody think about it? Uh, yeah, all Europeans, and, and uh, what else? All, white. all yeah, right, all white. Okay. All white, okay. Now, this is a long tradition. U.S.-led foreign policy, George Kennan, who used to be my, my favorite, uh, Statesman, I find out he's elitist. I found out he's racist. 
And the first policy paper coming out of the State Department after the war said, we have control of the 50% of the world's resources, but only represent one, one ninth of the world's population. And so we have to take advantage of everybody else. No more talk about human rights. <laughs> it's going to come to the exercise of hard power. That's what he said, okay? Now, Trump, what did he say? Well, when he was in China, he said, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything against the Chinese. They take advantage of, of other countries. I, I admire that. You got to take advantage of other countries. He said that, okay? Truman was a racist from the word go. He never referred to African Americans by any other label but the N word. He had his Secretary of State, Jimmy Burns, from South Carolina, okay? And Jimmy Burns and Truman were the only people in our government that thought it was okay to use the atomic bomb on people. Why? Because those people didn't look like us. That's why. One cannot completely understand the ease in which the authorities are able to persuade the American people to support war and aggression without understanding this concept of white supremacy, white supremacist ideology that, that uh, stratifies human beings into those humans who have rights that should be respected and those humans who make up the populations that are, in fact, killable. We're going to start with understanding that this is a settler colony, how black people are treated all over the world by the U.S. government determines that we are one people. And uh, the domestic colony of Africans in the United States were politically energized into liberation movements. We can see the liberate independence movements in Africa, and many people were familiar with the, liber the black power movement and civil rights struggle within the United States. It pretty much was happening at the same time. And the response to both was from the United States was through the FBI's COINTEL program and the subversion of our, our organizations and our movements here, that, and its counterpart, the CIA, things like AFRICOM, small arms into Africa, selling and proliferating. And, and the memorandum is very clear. It, it acknowledges that skirmishes or, or, or conflict, military conflict within the continent of Africa is really not exist and it's not something so that's not why they did it to help you know help them protect each other from each other how they how they how we're supposed to be seen as uh savages who who can't get along a few months ago africom although the corporate media didn't use the term very much uh was very much in the news uh because of uh u.s troop de deaths in the country of niger most of the media didn't even know how to pronounce it, but at any rate. But Niger, is, it's one of those places that uh, flies under the radar for most Americans, and that's to say they don't even know that it exists until they find out about some American military activity there. Uh, and that's what happened in October, after four American soldiers died there. And uh, actually, it was Donald Trump's uh, stupidity and racism which uh, made their deaths a news story. Uh, at first, the administration wasn't going to say anything about it. Then he was goaded by someone who uh, uh, suggested, well, he said that uh, Obama didn't call the troops' families and he was going to call their families. But of course, he messed it up. He couldn't even make a decent condolence call to the widow. And that became the news story. Uh, the African-American soldier, LaDavid Johnson, he spoke to his widow and a congresswoman who was a friend of the family overheard the conversation. He was very rude to her. The congresswoman said so. This, there was all this back and forth. But nobody talked much about Niger, about the fact that there was uh, this huge American presence in this country. Uh, there are approximately 800 uh, American soldiers there. There is a drone base. And Niger's role became uh, even more tragic after 2011. And that's because uh, that was the year in which the United States, Barack Obama, and with NATO, and with the help of uh, uh, Islamist groups, destroyed Libya, murdered the president, and, uh, and changed everything in that region of the continent. 
Now, this is part of um, uh, someone last night was talking about the project for a new American century. One of the essential aspects of that project is destroying secular Arab governments. So first it was uh, Iraq, then it was Libya, then they tried with Syria. You can argue that the Congo is the, the fulcrum on which the African continent swings. And it was central to the carving up of the continent in the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference, where European nations established their spheres of influence uh, in Africa. In fact, not only was it called the Berlin Conference, it was also referred to as the Congo Conference. The United Nations says it's the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II. But I don't recall seeing this kind of an uproar and interest in uh, purchase on the conscience of people about this tremendous loss of life, especially considering that the United States had a role to play in terms of it supporting its client states that triggered the war in Rwanda and Uganda by providing them with arms, equipment, <coughs> financing. Rwanda has received a billion dollars from the United States since 2000. Intelligence, and when some accountability is attempted to be instituted on these countries, the U.S. runs political and diplomatic interference. That but we don't have the wording right now, but I would like to, to get the okay from the conference for the conference as a whole to send a message uh, to the prosecutors and uh, uh, saying that we are, uh, want all the charges to be dropped um, and that we are opposed to the building of uh, and the keeping of U.S. military bases on Okinawa. So can I just hear um, uh, all those in favor of doing that, please just raise your hand. Okay, and any opposition? Okay, so I will say that that is a unanimous vote for doing that. So the three resolutions that were in your packet, um, uh, one was the therefore part, not the whereas is part. The therefore, be it resolved that the coalition against U.S. foreign bases unanimously calls upon the global peace movement to organize on February 23rd, 19, uh, 2018, excuse me, um, uh, actions calling for the United States um, to promptly withdraw all forces and personnel from Guantanamo Bay and immediately declare all um, agreements uh, ceding Cuban control of Guantanamo Bay to the U.S. to be null and void. All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those opposed? Is anybody abstaining? All right, I think we have passed that unanimously. Therefore be it resolved that the coalition against U.S. foreign military bases calls upon all forces of peace, social and environmental justice to join hands with us in a global coalition for convening a global conference against U.S. and NATO foreign military bases within a year of this national conference. And they further resolve that the coalition's present unity statement shall be used as the foundation and framework within which the new global coalition and the proposed global conference will be organized. And be it further resolved that the coordinating committee of the coalition against U.S. foreign affair, foreign military bases shall immediately start the process of soliciting global support for such global coalition and conference, identifying a host country for the conference, generating financial support, and taking a leading role along with our international allies in organizing the global conference against U.S. and NATO foreign military bases. Do we want this global coalition to be globally led or U.S. led? Uh, I think it's an important distinction because the globe will immediately suspect it of wanting to be the latter. And we have to be very, very careful, and which is why I think that the next to the last uh, paragraph 
needs to be taken out or needs to be tweaked. Uh, because if we say we're, we're creating a global coalition and we've already got the foundation and framework written and you need to follow it, I, I would prefer to say something like, you know, th this is offered as a starting place. I want to uh, suggest one small correction. Instead of saying U.S. and NATO foreign bases, to say uh, U.S. foreign bases and NATO bases, because from the perspective of all the struggles we have, those bases are in our countries, the NATO bases. People so. agree with that? Yes. yes. Okay, we will change, make that change. So where it says that the coalition's present unity statement shall be used, I think it'll ease the objection if you put is offered below. Is that okay with it? All right. Okay. Well, with those suggestions, that the room is in general agreement. So I would like to call for a vote. All those in favor of the resolutions with those suggestions, raise your hand. All those opposed, any abstentions? Okay, I think we have come to a unanimous agreement there. The peace movement has had a real proud tradition of holding some major actions around the country that have played a real role in ending wars, um, staying the hand of the war makers. So a resolution is presented here that we call for actions in the spring, call the question that we vote on a spring action along the general lines in the resolution and we will incorporate the, uh, the comments that people said during this session um, and we will call together a group of the entire anti-war movement to see if we can get the entire anti-war movement behind this call, and this will happen very, very quickly. All those in favor of that resol resolution with that, that concept, please raise your hand. All who are opposed. Okay, I can say that we have, uh, this conference has gone on record in support of a spring action. Well, folks, we made it, right? Wasn't it a great conference? Thanks to all of you.